It's an old boxing term, Barb. You must have heard that one. We're good. You're live. We're connected, Brian? Yes. Yes. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our meeting tonight. We have a number of committee meetings on tonight. And I'd like to welcome all of my fellow councillors and Deputy Mayor. All names are on the screen, the councillors. And we also have our Police Chief uh, Dave Poirier with us. And we have Aaron McDonald, our technical engineer from Tech Services and his assistant, Linda Stevenson. We also have our Deputy CAO and our in-house lawyer and our Director of Human Resources, Gordon McFarland is with us. We have our electrical engineer, Greg Goody with us. And yes, we have Rob Philpott, our CEO. And I'm just looking at the screen, I think. And Kristen, we have our director of finance with us. So welcome everybody and welcome to our viewers on YouTube and Facebook. And if there are members of the media listening or, uh, or watching, uh, welcome. And uh, we'll uh, continue on here. So uh, the first, committee meeting is the planning board and Councillor Brian McFeely, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Your Worship. I hope everybody can hear me here. I'm on my, uh, my phone, so uh, we will proceed. We have uh, one item on the planning board agenda tonight, uh, 136 Harvard Street, a major uh, variance application um, for a rear yard variance. I'll read the uh, recommendation to the record, Your Worship. All members of the planning board are, are present. And that includes uh, yourself, Your Worship, Councillor Ramsey, Councillor Adams, and myself, and certainly other councillors. Uh, we would encourage uh, participation as well. Uh, so the supporting explanation, the purpose, the purpose of the major variance is to allow a two unit dwelling at 136 Harvard Street, PID number 315390, to be located further back from Harvard Street than what the bylaw requires. The applicant would rather a larger front yard than rear yard, which in turn allows the driveway to be longer and parked vehicles are further away from Harvard Street. The background, the applicant met with city staff requesting setback information in the R3 zone. Upon review of the proposed uh, building location, uh, the site plan review, it was determined the major variance would be required. A variance application was received from Beverly and Kent March Bank for variance to the rear end. The applicants are requesting a rear yard variance as they would like to exceed the front yard requirements, which are six meters. They're proposing 8.8 .8 meters in the front. Uh, in efforts to have the proposed building be located further back from Harvard Street because of the narrow lot, no portion of the driveway can be accommodated along the side of the proposed dwelling. And the drawing is attached there, Your Worship, and you see the rear yard is where the, uh, the 11 foot marker is. Mm -hmm. I think the requirement is 16 and a half uh, feet in, in that regard on, on that particular drawing. Uh, so the report, the uh, variance to rear yard, the required lot frontage for the proposed building is five meters, 16.4 feet. The applicant is proposing a rear yard of 3.35 meters, 11 feet, a variance of 33%. Justification for the variance as required in section 7.2 of the city zoning bylaw SS-15, 2007. Council, planning board and the development officer shall consider the variance against the following test for justifying a variance. A, that the hardship is due to unique physical conditions of the lot or property, including small lot size, irregular lot shape, existing building location on the property, are exceptional topographical conditions, which make it impractical to develop in strict conformity with the bylaw standards. Exceptional to topographical conditions may include, but are not limited to, trees, slope of the land, etc. Staff comment. Yes, this variance request would meet this test. The characteristics of the lot has impact on the requirement for the variance as the lot size is existing. 
not a newly created lot. B, that the proposed variants meet the general intent of the official plan. Staff comment, yes, this variance request would meet this test. The existing lot land use is residential land use. C, that the proposed variance meets the general intent of the zone. Staff comment, yes, this variance request would meet this test. The medium density zone, the R3, allows up to two units as of right. The proposed two unit dwelling meets the required front and side yard setbacks. The variance will not impact the required setbacks of the existing neighbors. The variance impacts the two unit dwelling only as it is their yard that is most impacted. And the, uh, the map there shows the, uh, or the drawing there shows the, uh, the, the building being proposed building location being proposed. D, that the proposed variance would not impact negatively on adjacent properties or on the central character of the surrounding neighborhood, including taking into consideration any comments from neighbors. Staff comment, yes, this variance request would meet this test. 25 letters were mailed to 18 properties within 30 meters of the boundaries of the subject property. The property is bordered by neighbors on the west, east and south boundaries and the street on the north boundary. Comments from adjacent property owners were due on or before May 29th. Written comments were received from Kenneth Hogg, 82 Russell Street. Mr. Hogg feels the variant should be denied. His comments are included in this report. The neighbor, Mary Charlene Doucette of 180 Harvard Street met with the development officer to view the file and discuss the variance application. Ms. Doucet was concerned about the side yard. The applicant's proposed side yard setback 1.8 meters exceeds the required setback of 1.5 meters. And again, you can see the particular lot and uh, uh, lot number 315390 and the Doucet location as well as the hog location on the, uh, on the map attached there. The city zoning bylaw provides regulations for the uses of land and location of buildings on the property. And it's difficult for zoning bylaw provisions to take into account all circumstances such as pertaining to lot size, lot shapes, pie shaped lots, property line side setbacks or topographical conditions. This may impact the development of a particular property the hardships for variance cannot be an economic one, but must be technical in nature. The size and shape of the property or design of a building project may prevent the owner from fully meeting all of the provisions of the zoning bylaw. In such cases, a variance is a mechanism which is used to provide some degree of flexibility and discretion in applying strict provisions of the bylaw. As a general principle, uh, the variance must maintain the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw. It should never be used as a mechanism to circumvent or frustrate the intent of the bylaw. For example, a variance cannot be used to create a land use or to fully eliminate a required yard setback. Any person who is dissatisfied by a decision of council or the development officer made under the zoning bylaw may appeal to the Island Regulatory and Appeals Commission within 21 days of the decision accordance with the Planning Act. So the recommendation of technical service staff, <clears throat> staff recommend that the application from Beverly and Kent Marchbank PID number 315390 for 33% variance to the rear yard be recommended to be approved by council. As per section 7.2 of the zoning bylaw, the planning board shall make a recommendation to council on this application before it is approved or denied. The planning board recommendation, whether carried or defeated, will be brought forward to council for a final decision. And before we proceed with the recommendation, Your Worship, I'll read into the record the email from uh, Kenneth Hogg, uh, dated the, <clears throat> the uh, th Thursday, the 28th of May, 2020. Uh, this was to uh, Linda Stevenson, I believe. Thank you for taking the time to review my request to deny this variance. The property borders my backyard and my address is 82 Russell Street. There are already a six unit and a three unit building on Houston Street owned by the March Banks. 
This area of the city has many single family dwellings, but the area between buildings keeps getting smaller and smaller. To request it to be reduced by 33% seems extreme. And if an exception is made for one person, then another person will expect to get the same. The six unit building on Houston Street, also owned by the March Banks, has built storage sheds at, within inches of the property line and fence. The March Banks have cut limbs off a tree on my property without attempting to contact me to, to ask permission to cut these limbs. I have reported this incident to Summerside Police. They contacted a neighbor on the corner of Harvard and Russell Street who had a tree on their property and he asked permission to trim her tree, which she approved. They should have extended that same courtesy to me. I have a doorbell at all three doors of my home. My contact number is, is 902-439-2611. This number is listed on Canada 411 and many of my neighbors have it. And this is my, uh, my cell phone number and is on me 24 seven. And there are three mailboxes in my home, one at each door and they are checked daily. So they could have left me a note to contact them. I respectfully request that this variance be denied. I have lived at my home for 38 years and feel that we should have a respectful distance between dwellings and outbuildings to allow for children to play for gatherings of family and friends. Allowing adequate distance is also means that one property owner cannot plow snow from their property onto a neighbor's property. And this has also happened in the past. I support development within the city, but we have rules and regulations for a reason. Guidelines need to be followed so that we can build a better city for the future generations. Thank you again for the opportunity to allow me to be able to express my concerns with regards to this matter. Sincerely, Kenneth A. Hogg, 82 Russell Street, Summerside, PEI. So with that, Your Worship, I would... Uh, uh, call for a mover and seconder for the the recommendation to bear the uh, bear the recommendation to the planning board so if a member of planning board would could move that and second that we could uh, open the floor for discussion yeah just a couple of questions mr chairman did you see that brian it was carrying uh, i didn't see the mover and seconder your worship just one one second right. please uh, so moved by councillor ramsey seconded by councillor adams Sure. That's the, the motion's been moved and seconded, so we'll open the floor for discussion. Your Worship, you have the floor. Well, just uh, a couple of questions. I'm just wondering, uh, does that variance include the deck? It looks like there's a deck on one one of the units. I'm just wondering about that. And it, it, uh, there are three mailboxes you said I was housed. It, it, does this home with three apartments in it? Two units, I understand, Your Worship, the rentals. No, I mean, uh, Mr. Uh, Lady Russell, Mr. Uh, Hogg. Hogg. Oh. We don't I, have him. No, it said uh, he has three mailboxes. I'm wondering if he has two extra apartments in his house or what that is. I don't know. I'm not sure, Your Worship. I don't know if staff are aware of that. Or any other councillors? I'm not. It, it is in my ward, but I'm not sure if possibly it could be checked. If he, he said he had three doorbells, so I'm assuming if an apartment doorbell was rang, he wouldn't hear it. So it, it sounds like it's they're all his mailboxes just from his email. That's, that's what I took from it, that it was a single family home. Okay. Would Aaron or Linda know? Uh, I'm not aware that it's, that it's anything other than a single family dwelling. Okay. No, I was just wondering. He's a property owner. Is all, we contacted him, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there just one deck in the building? Sorry, and then I'm finished. There's just one deck in one of the units, according to my sketch. Yes, the, all we can see on the sketch on the first page is it says covered deck, and the other little bump out it says utility. So whether that's a, I don't think that's a deck on the top of the page, but on one part it just says covered deck. And that that deck would be on the Harvard Street side of the building. Correct. Okay, so. That deck is included in the variance, is it? The deck is on the side and on the side, and they do not need a variance on the side. Oh, okay. Just the the, the the back to go from the 
allowable 16 and a half feet roughly to 11 feet is the is the request so, uh, Mr. so if they go the 11 feet then um is that mr is that um mr hogg's property that they're going to, if they put a deck there are they that much closer to mr hogg's property is that is that what i'm reading linda uh yeah there, there's no proposal for a deck on the back of the house at this time and if there was a deck it would have to be, it would still have to be four or five feet from his property line. Mm -hmm. And right now it's 1.5 meters with the house. Okay, we're talking about, okay, so, so uh, Harvard Street is on the right hand side, or left hand side of your page of the report. That's right. So the covered deck that's on the side, there's, that covered deck is, is near, is facing his own apartment building. So where, where he's re, where he's reducing the rear yard is at the back where it's 11 feet where it shows 11 feet. Okay, I've got the other one up. Okay, 11 feet. And that meets Russell right there. That meets the side yard of Mr. Hogg's property. Right, right on Russell Street. Okay. Okay, thank you. Your question on the deck, he could still build a deck in that 11 foot space, but he could only be five feet from the property line. Right. Right. Thank you. Any other questions yeah. from planning I board or council? I do. Um, I guess, uh, Councillor Brian, uh, what I'm wondering about, there were 25 letters that were mailed out. It says that 18 properties were or are within 30 meters of the boundaries. So, are those 18 properties, is it not compulsory for them to hear from them? Or uh, we've only heard from the two residents. Is that, that's correct. Uh, but what about the 18 that's mentioned in the report? They, I, I, I would ask staff to comment, but I, my comment would be that uh, they had the opportunity to respond to the letter and make contact with staff. And it's my understanding I'm talking to staff that those were the only two that made contact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Linda, that can you verify that? That's correct. There was, there was 25 letters sent uh, to 18 different properties because some properties have two owners. Okay. And I'm just trying to uh, just very quickly go back in the report that you had mentioned, uh, Councillor Brian, that, uh, and, and I'll, I'll ask it as well of Linda or Director Rearn, uh, with the property, with, with the size of the property, is there some problems that the variance can't be met unless they make those changes or be, in order to have more room in the back of their, or in the front of their yard? So if you look at the, if you look at the, the uh, drawing that's on page two okay. of the report, the dashed line are our standards for our setbacks. So yes. he can build anywhere within that box. Okay. Okay, uh, he's he's requesting to move it back further from Harvard Street just because of traffic and he figures it'll be snow removal in the winter time. He doesn't wants to give himself a little bit more space in the front of the building because it's closest to the busiest street. Okay, <coughs> thank you. Um, I, I have my hand up, Brian. I don't know if you can see. No, I can't. I'm still trying to, I'm gonna get connected here, I hope. So. Okay. So, uh, Councillor Ramsey. So I do. Um, so it's traffic and then he wants a longer driveway, Linda. Is that what, um, was that one of the, like, I guess, what, what's the reason to go back? Is it just the traffic or does he want a longer driveway? Um, and, and I guess my question is, being on the planning board, if, if, if 15 people come in because they want a longer driveway, are they going to be able to move their house back because it's it's not part of the bylaw, right? So I'm just I'm just putting that out there. Um, so I guess I, my question is is what was the reason for wanting to set the house back in the first place? The driveway. This, this, the reason for the setback is he wanted to move the house itself back from the street, which yeah. would then in turn give him a longer driveway. So he's got a little more space behind his vehicles if, like, say, they're piling back snow or just more traffic. He wanted his vehicles to be further away or the vehicles there parked a little further off the street. Okay. Just just a quick, quick question, Brian. 
Councillor Snow, the floor is yours. Uh, so I wanted to add on to what Councillor Ramsey just said. Uh, if it's just for a longer driveway or, or whatever, what in what circumstance would planning board or staff recommend against the variance? Because it, I, I don't see the absolute need for the variance. It's a more of a want, I guess. And so where would you say, no, that's not. And if, if so, why do we have that variance in place that we, or why do we have that distance in place in the first place if, if somebody comes in and says, I want to set it back another whatever for a longer driveway, then I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around the uh, recommendation to go ahead with it when we have uh, some, some yeah, distances okay. in place. Yeah, uh, understood. Uh, uh, staff, uh, could, could you comment on that? I guess both of us can. I guess sometimes it depends on individual cases. What is the, if you're backing out of someone else's backyard, are you encroaching on the backyard or are you really close to their house? You know, are you really close on the side yard where the existing house in the next lot is also very close? So you're trying to maintain distance away from structures and, and uh, that sort of thing. Where in this case, you're backing out of someone else's backyard. Uh, and, and I guess that's for, for consideration for you guys to consider is, is it an encroachment on the person's backyard too much to allow? and uh, then make your consideration and vote. Thank you. Aaron, is it on, on an eight foot foundation or you're slipping it back and forth? What's the sitting on the home? On the first page, the back part is known it's slab on grade. On the, on the first page of the memo, the back it's written on their slab on grade. So that's why we have to go by right now. Go with the slab. Yes. So is, is one of the rationales for the requests to uh, increased parking so they can get two cars off the street in there for the two units they, they're still they're still not going to get two cars with a 29 feet they're still not going to get two cars part one park behind the other that would not give them enough space he just said he wanted to be able to move the vehicles further away from the street and move the the uh, main wall of the, the front of the house so that I just prefer to have a more, more a little more front yard and the, our front yard minimum is 20, 20 feet for the purpose of getting a vehicle off the uh, street right of way and in, entirely into their yard. So in metric terms, our parking stalls are typically six meters long at City Hall. And that's typically a setback so that someone can get a, a parking stall completely on their own property and not be, if there was a sidewalk went by or it'd be entirely on their property. That's some of the reason for the rationale of and also that the houses are set back and not right on the street. It's a combination so, of set back as well as uh, parking. So if he was to move that back to the the uh, 16 and a half feet in the backyard, which is allowed under the bylaw, does that help him accomplish some of his goals for the front? He's requesting 29 feet. Right. So it, it, it could somewhat, I guess. I, I mean, he, I, I, his logic was to, to move it back. He's only encroaching into his own green space at the back of the unit. Right. He's okay. Not, Understood. Not attacking yeah. anyone else. Yeah. Right. I can't see hands here, folks. Does anybody else Norma? have a question Norma? or comment? Councilor Bay. Go ahead, Councillor Bruce. Okay, thank you. I uh, I just uh, I, I think on my years in council, it's the first time I ever had to deal with somebody moving their house back. This usually asks for a variance when they're building or they're adding on, but this is a complete. So I think this is a one in a twenty-five year thing because uh, uh, you know, and I don't see a big issue with it. Trying to get some uh, space at the front of the house. Uh, and the amount that he's going back, if it's his backyard, uh, I, I don't see a big issue. So I just wanted to put my thoughts in there. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McComan? Yes. Um, Deputy Mayor McComan, my apologies. You're muted, Norma. 
I've got it now. Uh, I guess I just keep going back to the email that we received from Mr. Hogg. Um, I'm wondering with the property, are the March banks going to live in one of those units? Is that the house that they live in now? And then they're going to have another unit that's rentable. Is that the plan? My understanding is that there will both be rentals, but I would ask for staff to confirm that. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mar Marchbank indicated he would rent them, but it is their intention in the future to move into one of those units. All right, and again, the, I'm just uh, going through the email again with regards to, um, it seems that there is some concern about the guidelines needing to be needing to be followed so that we can build a better city for the future generation. But I, I think the two things that I picked up in the email is that uh, there were some different difficulties or uh, encroachment over tree limbs being cut by the neighbors as well as snow removal. And I'm just wondering if that would be something that both of those neighbors could discuss to work that out between themselves. Cause I mean, that's coming before council, but it really, with, with the request that's in on the application, I, I think that's a, like a side, a side matter that needs to be discussed in my opinion. I, I think the neighbors would have to have that discussion. I'm not sure that with a backyard variance like this, that the snow removal would be as big an issue with that, that backyard border as it would with the side borders maybe as well. So our, if there's no other questions or comments, is planning board uh, prepared to vote on the motion? But I have one other question, Brian, Councillor. Yes, Just you were. I'm trying to sort this out here. On the bottom part of that drawing, does this gentleman own property right besides that one too? That is correct. Oh, yeah. he does. Which one at the at the bottom or the right side? He owns the one at the bottom of the page. Okay. And this one here is, is new construction. That's correct. He owns this lot. It's a vacant lot. Uh, and he is gonna propose to, to build this two unit. A, the one on the bottom is the six unit. Is that what he's saying? The one next door, yeah, which is is south, uh, is west of this building. Okay. It's, it's an apartment building on the corner of uh, Houston and Harvard that is it, owned by the market. So he basically owns the corner there. Thank you. Okay, uh, hearing no further questions, we'll, we'll, we'll call for the vote on the recommendation. Uh, it's been duly moved and seconded, so... Uh, the I, recommendation I, is to take it to council, right? The recommendation from planning board is that it be, uh, be approved to go to council, yes. Is that clear for everybody? We will call the question then. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Contrary? I hear no contrary votes, so the motion is passed as uh, as presented to your worship, and that concludes planning board. And I, I, uh, if I may, your worship, uh, I know I will need uh, unanimous support from council to add a very very quick uh, uh, update on uh, on uh, the uh, COVID uh, task force that economic development are a part of. I think you got um, unanimous uh, support to do that. Go two, ahead. two quick points to make with that in terms of an update and, and the kind of co-chair Justin is on there as well. He may have something to add, but uh, uh, Friday we launched the, the Forward Summerside Initiative, which is basically a virtual mall. Uh, I understand there's upwards to 60 businesses now now uh, uh, registered on, on that. And... Uh, I would encourage uh, folks to uh, to go to uh, www.forwardsummerside.ca to have a look at that. It's really uh, uh, works very very well, um, and it really encourages people to buy local and shop local. And and uh, the other thing I would ask uh, members of council to do is to circulate that to their network. 
and uh, contacts and, and ask any businesses that they know uh, to, to uh, join. There's a place on there where business can go and be added to the, uh, to the inventory of businesses. And uh, we'll be beginning to get reports as we move forward here and how many people are visiting each of these places as well. So uh, it's, it's, it's a great initiative and, and it's moving forward. The second initiative of the, and, and that basically the, the city was very involved in the formation of that uh, website. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce has basically taken over the management of it and the coordination of it and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we thank them for that. The second initiative that is uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of being unveiled here, uh, sort of a soft unveiling last week and, and unveiled this week is a Buy It Forward campaign. And this is really the contribution of downtown Summerside as a member of the COVID-19 task force. The concept's simple. You buy a gift certificate or a card from a local businesses and you gift it to a friend and then challenge that friend to keep it going. If you're someone who likes to share on social media, and we really encourage people to do that and using the hashtag to find and give kudos to those who are participating. So the, co the goal of the campaign is to get people shopping locally and encouraging others to do the same. People who have already been participated in this are some of the radio people, host Chris Pride, District MLA, uh, Steve Howard, uh, our very own councillor, Kerry Adams, and the Western Capitals and several others. So we really encourage people to get involved with that. And I'm really going to challenge council and I'm, I'm challenging council by by uh, putting a gift certificate for Holman's ice cream into each of your mailboxes here tonight. And uh, that's my challenge to you folks as sort of chair of, uh, of this COVID task force uh, is to give you each a gift certificate for Holman's uh, ice cream and hope that you will reciprocate and, uh, and pass, uh, buy it forward for other people in the community. So. Uh, thank you for your indulgence and uh, the gift certificate is to pay back for allowing me a few minutes on the agenda tonight to uh, present that. So thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, uh, Councilor McFeely. You're on two places here now. I believe your computer is connected. There you go. Yeah, I'm going to go off this other one and go on right. the computer. Would you just right. mind giving that, that email again, www.forwardsummerside? www.forwardsummerside, all one word, .ca. .ca, yeah. yeah. Just so folks get that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thanks, got folks. I got okay. one. Thank you. Councilor, sorry, to, uh, you had a question, uh, Councilor Adams? I was just going to say I got mine today, so I got a Cool Breeze gift certificate. Now I have home room, so I'm all, all set. Bye. Bye. I have my uh, person all ready for tomorrow. So anyways, we'll, we'll keep it going. So it's awesome. Thank you. Okay, we'll continue on. Uh, Councillor Duran, I believe you have tech services. Uh, it would appear so. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yours, sir. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Sorry? Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay, I just have an issue there. Um, so we'll call the tech services committee uh, meeting to order. Uh, there's only one item on the agenda tonight. I'm not sure who submitted it, but um, whoever did, I'll let them take the lead. It is for the uh, trailer located on the property on Avon Street. I, I'm sure. Yeah. Who put that on? Who's board is that? Councillor Duran, uh, Mr. T Mr. Chair, I'll just uh, speak to that just for a second, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Tech Services for, uh, I guess, more of a briefing. Uh, this was an item uh, uh, that was uh, first uh, followed up on, or first uh, identified by staff last fall as uh, an issue. Uh, we've had uh, some correspondence and communication with uh, the occupant uh, of the trailer. And since there's been uh, several developments with respect to uh, on-site properties that we've been working on in the area, uh, we wanted to uh, give council a little bit of an update uh, or a little bit of the background and history on this particular file 
and then to, to seek any uh, direction as is necessary. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just to turn it over to tech services to give council a briefing on this particular file. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, just to clarify one point at the start, I guess, this wasn't uh, initiated by staff. Someone had uh, brought forward a complaint. I would, I would assume it was uh, compiled with, there's three properties up here that there was issues with last fall, uh, unsightly trees from the hurricane, as well as the trailer. And as a, it, when we went up to look at all three properties, uh, we got tasked with this portion of it. So it came about from uh, back in say October, late, late October or November. So uh, we were passed on that the potential was someone living in this RV. Um, our staff then uh, worked with the police uh, services and we uh, made some visits ourselves to verify if there was uh, activity in there. Uh, we did monitor a few times to say that yes, it appeared to be someone there at least in the later evening hours. Uh, then in the middle of November, staff did prepare a, a letter to the landowner and uh, brought another copy and went to the site and uh, hand delivered it to the actual property owner as the house out front, as well as uh, dropped off one to the, the camper at the time. Uh, shortly after uh, getting the letter, a copy of the letter is, in, is in, attached to the meeting package. And it was just advising the property owners that, uh, you know, recreation vehicles can be in someone's yard. If someone comes to visit, uh, they can be, you know, be there for 30 days. Uh, that's all. Uh, also was noted that uh, no recreational vehicle or camper, camper can be used as a permanent dwelling in the city. So there was two different things there. We're just notifying the landowner that that's what the current rules are. And we asked them to please ensure that there was no one living in the trailer. Uh, a couple of days later, uh, a gentleman arrived down at the, I'll say the city core. He first, I think, went over to the police services to uh, respond with the letter he got. Um, they can speak to their conversations with them. Uh, after them, he, he came over to us. Uh, it was very, you know, he, he wasn't irate or anything. He was not happy, but he basically explained the situation is that uh, whether he's down on his luck or had some injuries and in situations, he currently did not have a a better place to live. He'd been looking and searching around for something that he could afford, was having difficulty finding lodging. And yes, he was staying. I can't be 100% sure on all the conversation for, verbatim, but whether he was staying sometimes in the house or in the camper all the time, uh, we told him that can't stay. Uh, this was late in November. Uh, we gave him a time period to try and find lodging. I don't know if it was 30 or 60 days, but by then he would certainly have to have the camper either moved off the property or he couldn't be staying in it. And by the end of the calendar year, it was no longer there. Um, so then it came springtime. Um, I was touring around some of the sites uh, that we had some issues with, uh, with unsightly properties. And I would buy this one and the camper was not there. And then ironically, uh, within a couple of days, I think it resurfaced again through uh, some counselor circulating uh, a picture where the camper was there. So I drove by again and yes, the camper reappeared back in, in April or something. So here we are at the same situation where we have uh, a gentleman that can't find lodging. Uh, we had a lot of concerns ourselves about someone staying in a property like this in the winter months. And uh, now we're into the spring or summer season, but it's still in our rules and we're just, uh, we were asked for an update on it, and we're, I guess, at the point now where we're looking for direction how we're going to proceed. So, I guess I'll start. This this is in my ward, uh, and very unfortunate, obviously, that we have a resident that is struggling to find some housing. Um, but we do have bylaws in place. So it goes back to the old thing I keep preaching that we, if we have bylaws in place, we gotta make sure we enforce them the best we can. Um, it's, I think it's safe to say neighboring properties have had some issues. Um, and 
we're trying to rectify those as properly as we can. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I don't know how we proceed carefully that we don't uh, create some hardship for someone. Um, but I, I, like I said, I, we, we do have bylaws in place and, and it is a concern for some of the neighbors and, and it's set out pretty clear in our bylaws that you can't uh, be on a residential property in an RV and living in it for extended period of time. So um, I, I don't know what we've done in the past uh, in the city. I'm sure it's not the first time this has happened. Um, so if there's any past uh, experiences that have happened similar or, or ways that we've dealt with it uh, previously, that'd be great to know. And then we can sort of decide from there. But um, it, it's very safe to say that the neighboring properties are uh, not happy with the current situation. So so we need to look at our bylaw and try to enforce it accordingly. If I can respond there, Councilor Snow, um, we haven't had a lot of these situations. Uh, we had one last year, I think, that we didn't do with ourselves. I think police services handled the file. It was out on Route 1A. And it was a situation, again, where those people living in a camper for, I don't know, three weeks or four weeks or six weeks, I'm not sure which. Uh, they had done some monitoring of the site and determined that there was people there. Uh, they gave them, it was a similar situation. I think it was a single parent with a couple of children and having difficulty finding a alternate lodging. Uh, I think they gave them a certain amount of time to, and they and thankfully they were fortunate enough to be able to find some alternative housing. I don't think alternative housing, they found an alternate option for housing and then they were no longer in that. Uh, a number of years ago, there might've been one other uh, across from the cup where we got a report where someone was in it. Uh, staff went down with the assistance of uh, police services and checked out the property and advised the people and, the, and then that ceased or they no longer were residing in the camper. So in other instances, it has worked itself out. But in this case, uh, it appears like it's it's uh, back again this year and, and uh, we'd have to advise you what the next steps are with the assistance of perhaps Gordon as far as the enforcement of the bylaws so that you guys would know what the next steps are. Uh, Director McFarland, I think I saw your hand up. Did you want to respond to anything? I, I was just going to suggest that um, uh, th the last corresponds with the property owner and the gentleman that we, I guess, are assuming is in the trailer um, was in the fall. Um, I would suggest we, you know, through tech services, have a draft a letter to them outlining the alleged violation of the bylaw um, and, and go from there. Um, the enforcement mechanism in our zoning bylaw is a uh, summary prosecution ticket. Um, so, you know, if the issue doesn't get dealt resolved, um, you know, through the normal course of letters and correspondence, then would have to go through that enforcement procedure. But um, in order to successfully go through that enforcement procedure, we, we'll, you know, there's some due diligence that we have to do up front. So I'd suggest the next step is, is I hate to say another letter, but another letter. That's. And Gordon, I guess just for clarification for all members of council, that would come with uh, a 30 day uh, time limit as well, correct? Uh, I don't have the bylaw in front of me, but it would come with some time limit for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's no real time frame laid out. It's whatever you feel you would deem it. Uh, the only 30 day reference is that if someone came to visit you on your property and relatives came home with a camper, they could stay on your property with their camper for 30 days. That's the only reference to 30 days. But typically you're trying to provide a period that you feel that they can find lodging or in this case you'd say, how long is it going to take them to find logically to find some alternative lodging? Okay, so I saw three hands and the order I saw them was Councillor Ramsey, Councillor Adams and Deputy Mayor McCollum. So Councillor Ramsey? And you're you're muted, Barb. There, sorry guys. So I just uh, a couple of things. Is it the same person um, from year to year that's that's living in in the 
the trailer, I guess would be one question. And then the other thing I, I, I've received phone calls that in that particular trailer, there's a bucket underneath where the waste is, is running out and there's a board behind the bucket. And, you know, so the neighbors are really, really upset about it. And um, so I guess, so I, I know that there are some real concerns. I'm getting a number of phone calls on it. And, and uh, so I guess that's, and that's the problem with living in a trailer, right? There's nowhere for the waste to go and nowhere for the water to run and, and those sorts of things. So anyway, that's, that's just, uh, so do we know if it's the same person? Is this, is this like, I don't, I don't know who it is, but is it the same person? Does anyone know? Like, is it? We do not make, we did not make contact, but when the last time we did, uh, I believe the chief might be able to speak. I think that the vehicle is licensed and registered and legal for the road. And this person said that they were the owner. So, okay. I can't, but I can't say for sure if that's who's in it. Okay. Yeah, it is, uh, the same owner folks, uh, Okay. from year to year. Uh, we spoke about, oh, I don't know, last fall, and he asked if you could drive the trailer around. I said, well, as long as it's legal and licensed for the road, insured, you're, you're good to go. So he did take it away for a while, but it is certainly back there. We I, know understand, the I understand as well uh, that he does uh, live in the house occasionally to let him stay inside on the colder nights. Um, um, just, just a quick, Justin, I, I, I need to say something because it's been popping up uh, and I know the media is covering this and this, this is sort of a, speaks to a broader issue than we as city councillors can handle when we're talking about, you know, lack of housing, somebody really struggling to find housing. Um, and with some of the unsightly property stuff that Teresa will be going through the media and showing actual houses. And I, I think I would, I would hope, um, and I'm saying this out loud, I would hope the media would really take a second thought about how they maybe cover some of that stuff and not, it, it almost got into a public shaming recently on social media and stuff. And, and as a city councilor, um, you know, that this one of these properties are in my ward and it the intent is all good but we can't have it where we're you know publicly shaming people and it's being shared through social media you use a generic picture use something you can you can cover the story without physically taking pictures of properties that so uh, i'm concerned that this will continue sort of that process and I, I i really would hope that that wouldn't happen so we're trying to address some issues that are very serious to neighbors and other residents throughout the city. Um, but the people that are actually living through this stuff, it's, it's definitely not easy for them either, but we, we do have to enact our bylaws and figure ways to move things forward. But I just respectfully ask that we think of that as we're covering stuff. Okay. Thank you. And just, yeah, just on that, I mean, I'd have a hard time supporting effectively, you know, kicking this person to the curb with nowhere to go. I, I'd have a hard time doing that. So hopefully we can come up with something to address some of these other things. But um, uh, Councillor Adams, do you still have? Yeah, it just, it, I guess it's very unfortunate that this person is in this situation. And like, as you said, um, Justin, if they can reach out and try and get assistance for a place to live. Um, it was mentioned that this vehicle is registered and road ready. Um, it is summer now. So we have our local campgrounds that this person could hopefully be able to take advantage of. There is the issue with the safety issue, um, the health and safety issue with where they are dumping the waste too, right? It's not just that um, somebody is living in this, it's the health and safety of the residents around that if anything was to happen, um, it, it could be very bad. So um, hopefully this can get worked out. There was a letter sent, um, as we can see last November, um, it's keep saying unfortunate that this person had to stay there for the winter, but they are still there. Um, now it's camping season and hopefully they can take advantage of an alternate site for a while. And while they're there, work on and reach out to somebody to help them 
get a per more permanent place to stay because I don't think we want to hear about something unfortunate happening because happening you're living in that um, camper for the for the winter especially. So right, that's it for me. Uh, Chief Dave, did you want to respond to Gary? Uh, yes, yeah, so I spoke to this gentleman, like I said, some time ago and I mentioned the campground. This was early last fall. And uh, he said two things. He said, you know, he's got no money. And also he has a dog, a, a pet dog that he keeps with him. That's his only friend. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you feel sorry for the guy. Yeah. He can't afford the campground, he said. Right. Uh, Deputy Mayor McComan and uh, Councillor Bruce McDougall. Okay. Th thank you, Councillor Duran. Um, I think we've all talked pretty much around that same area. Uh, I'm just wondering if, if the person involved, if there, if there is children, I think it's, it's a fact that we need to be really aware of, that there are people within the community where poverty is, you know, a real concern. Uh, I guess it, where it concerns me is that we do get applications for units and, and development or whatever. And I think every one of us as counselors have taken that on our platform that we wanted to see affordable housing and those kinds of things. So uh, I know that we're not a part of a provincial department or health, but I'm just wondering if there has any, has there been any information to help this person so that they know uh, who to contact if they are trying to get affordable housing. And I realize it's not our job, but yet again, uh, we're looking at it from one side of, of the impact that it has on the neighbors and health standards. But I'm also thinking sometimes if people are in a situation, they just really need some help or a hands up to know who to call. So has anything like that been done? Mr. Chairman, can I just make a comment? Sure, and then uh, Councillor McDougall, I think, is, okay. is... Uh, just and I understand everybody's comments and appreciate and respect everybody's opinion, and it's a terrible situation. But what would happen if we had two or three or ten of these? You know, that uh, at what point it, does it get out of hand, or is it out of hand now? I mean, uh, we I know we feel sorry for the situation, but uh, uh, this could get out of hand if we don't uh, do something about it. I mean, what would happen if we had seven more of them? Would we, would we be saying the same thing or 10 more, you know? Uh, and, and, and your worship, that's, that's exactly what I've been basically preaching for the last year and a half is that, you know, we have bylaws and, and regardless if it's one or 10 or 15, they got to be enforced because otherwise it does get out of hand. So um, I, I'll tell you, I feel for anybody that's in a situation like this, that's really struggling. I, I really truly do it. It breaks my heart a little bit, but we, we need to figure a way that we can address these issues uh, without causing too much hardship for people, but but addressing the issue that's in front of us, which is uh, there's a bylaw infraction, and we, we need to make sure it's addressed in some way. I think or that's, your way of addressing it. that's your way of addressing it is through the bylaw. Right. I guess it bothers me that He's not, it's not hooked up to a sewer system. It's got to be very bothersome for the neighbors and smelly and everything else. It, it is very bothersome. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Councillor McDougall and Councillor Ramsey. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Duran. I, uh, you know, this is very unfortunate and we got to remember here, this is an open session and we're talking about a personality and I, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm sitting back and listening and uh, there's people that get down on their luck. And, you know, I think what we need to do is pass this back to staff, our t CAO, our police department, tech services, and, and uh, our law, and uh, see how we can help this person. Uh, I know, you know, it happened last year, and we're going to have to do the same thing this year. And, and uh, but just remember that we are talking about a personality, so and uh, people will know who it is. So uh, it's, it's not a great situation for any city to have, but we're very fortunate. We don't have a lot of this. So uh, that's, that's it for me. Thanks. Hey, uh, Councillor Ramsey. 
Yeah, and thank you, Bruce. And and uh, you know, I I feel I don't know who it is, by the way, um, but um, I feel bad for who it is, and I also agree that or or, or understand that there could be ten of them with the housing problems the way they are right now and the issues that we have with housing, there could be 10 of them. So, you know, I, I agree that somehow maybe we as a city, when people are having these types of difficulties that we could reach out somehow and show them where the resources are or, you know, help them with, with um, some direction, I guess, in um, where they go next or, or who, who might be able to, to give them a hand. Um, because no, it, but, <laughs> but for the grace of God, there go I, right. And, uh, so it could be, it could be any one of us. So, so yeah, so I, I, I certainly don't mean to address any personality by any means. I'm just, yeah, I certainly understand the problem. And if it, if it's, if it's going from year to year, then, then it's a real problem. Right. And, and somebody needs some help here. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. So, uh, having said all that, is there, I guess, a consensus now to direct staff to either attempt to address or readdress a couple of the issues that are really creating the complaints, or, or are we just going to send another letter? I, 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 per I personally think there's a few things that have to happen. I, obviously, if legally we have to send another letter, um, that should happen. Um, the issues of the waste needs to be addressed and and figure a way to move this forward meaningfully that it doesn't happen we're in this exact same place next year because let's face it we're in june now uh september october october comes really quickly and then we're back to summer again so i i, I see how quickly time flies as you're <laughs> sitting in these seats and and i i would hate to be here in the exact same position next summer talking about the same thing um, so we got we got to find a meaningful way forward and definitely try to get the person some help that's in an awful situation. But we also got to keep in mind that there's neighbors there to, that are dealing with uh, what they think is uh, not necessary. So we need to find a way forward. Is, is there any indication, uh, Chief, that this person might have a want or a desire to address a couple of these things or is it more of a just agreeing while you're there kind of thing and then and then kind of back to where everything started like is there a desire to want to improve any of these issues it, from what you can tell or from what your officers can tell no most of the officers haven't dealt with this gentleman before i've dealt with him on a couple of cases he's easy to get along with but the bottom line is he, he's got no place to go, uh, no money. And, you know, and also he mentioned to me not too long ago about the pandemic now, you know, and uh, that we're in the middle of, and uh, he's just down in his luck. Mm. Social assistance should be looking after that too, social services. I mean, that's their responsibility, uh, a provincial responsibility. And maybe if, if staff are gonna do something on it, I'd, I'd, I'd be down at their office saying, this person has to be looked after for health reasons and for the health of the neighbors and there's a list as long as you're armed the reasons why. Certainly your worship you never mentioned anything about being on social assistance so. Uh, no but I'm, I'm not saying that, that about that but that's the Department of Social Services to look after those kinds of situations. Deputy Mayor Coleman. Uh, this just uh, food for thought. Where, where the individual would start would be at Access PEI Income Support uh, to speak to uh, a worker there to help address, you know, what some of the needs could be. And also PEI Housing would be a place to access. And I can get those numbers for you, Chief. So there's no, there, there's, it's unlikely that this individual would be watching us tonight. So is there... And it'd be a shame just to move on to the next agenda item, just without really doing anything. So is it right to maybe, I don't know who it would be, but to, to compile a list of these things or a couple of options that we can hand off to this person that maybe they don't know about? 
Like uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, just in terms of based on what we're hearing from uh, Council on this particular issue, uh, obviously, uh, as Council has heard, there is a little bit of a history in terms of uh, some communications that we've had with uh, the occupant of the trailer. Uh, we will, as per the bylaw, we will follow up with that individual and just uh, have some discussions uh, and advise him around uh, where he is, I guess, not in compliance with the bylaw at this point in time, but we also will research and provide some options to him as to certain things that he may be able to follow up on if he so desires. And like Councillor Snow said too, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to be talking about this next summer, but I don't think we want to be talking about it next month. Because with the heat coming, the odor and the smell around there is going to be terrible. So I think we, we've got to do something fairly quickly to help the gentleman. Okay. So from what I understand, uh, CAO Rob will be indicating to him again that he's not in compliance and will provide him oh. with a couple of contacts to, that he may or may not have already. And, Go from there, go ahead, Councillor Snow. So if we deliver the letter and in the letter it states that it, it, you know, he can only be up there for 30 days, we already know that the trailer's been there longer than that, but we haven't provided a letter updated other than the one that he received last November. Um, if there is a letter presented to him saying he has 30 days, um, the, we already said the trailer, or it's a mobile home, I think is, you know, road ready, it's registered. Um, there's nothing saying he can't move the trailer and move on. Um, I don't know where he moves, but that, again, we need to be, you know, soft in thinking of, you know, it, it is a person, but we, we also got to really follow the rules we set in place. So uh, I, I, it, it really concerns me that, like his worship says, we're going to be here in a month's time talking about this, this still. So, if we could get that letter out and then based on that, uh, you know, try to get the person as many resources or information as possible so they can access uh, some resources and and uh, make sure we're still addressing the issue that's in front of us. Mr. Chairman, last summer, as you know, we had uh, maybe the last two or three summers and, and Aaron McDonald would know this, we had a request from somebody that wanted to park a little trailer on their lot that they own in Summerside for two or three weeks and they got a flat out no from the city. Uh, and they planned to build a house on it. But uh, this, uh, there was a no there, but that this one has been going on for some time, so. Uh, doesn't make a lot of sense, does it, Your Worship? Well, it just doesn't quite add up. But uh, no. for the sake of the neighbors and uh, health-wise, we can't let that go on. So it's one thing to have that information, those resources, but it's another to, want to take them and use them. Um, so hopefully they'll do the latter. Uh, yeah, well, Rob, do you have a final point? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to follow up on Councillor Snow's point uh, that uh, just to be clear that our approach will be that yes, we are uh, following through on uh, addressing this issue uh, as per the bylaw, but also uh, trying to balance that with empathy for the individual situation as well. Just so we, we want all the council to know that. Okay, so I think it's a, that's a good point to end on, and uh, I guess we'll probably be updated in the coming weeks or days. We will keep you posted, yes. Thank you. So if there's nothing else, I guess we'll just uh, move for adjournment of the Tech Services Committee meeting. Thank you very much, Councillor Duran. And I believe Councillor Ramsey is up next with the police report, and I believe if I follow my agenda correctly. I believe yes. I am, but... You're gonna have to just give me a second because I'm not prepared. It's right here. Um, okay. Call the meeting to order and uh, the approval of the agenda. And uh, so we're going with the parking on both sides of the streets for Highland and Cambridge. So. Parking um, or no parking? No parking. No parking. Well, so, well, it's it, parking on both sides and that's what's happening now. And that's the problem. I'm getting some calls, um, certainly for a number of streets in my area. And I know that Cambridge is in Councillor uh, or Deputy Mayor uh, Norma's um, area. So um, I 
Yes, I, I did send a note out um, with concerns um, where vehicles are parking on both sides of the streets. I assumed, and maybe I just, I wasn't aware of this. I, I assumed that they, there was every street in Summerside, you were allowed to park on one side of the street or the other, but not both. <laughs> that was my understanding because my little street here, that's the way it is. And most streets, I think that's the way it is. Anyway, that's not, not what's happening in a lot of the streets. And one is Highland. <laughs> and I've had a lady complain that there wouldn't be room for a vehicle to get through there if uh, an emergency vehicle had to, you know, had to get through. So I said I would bring it to council. Same thing was happening over on North Market Street. I got a call for that street as well. Um, there was a vehicle parking right on the corner of North Market and St. Lawrence. Yeah, so anyway, um, that was that was sent in um, to police services and I think they, they may have dealt with that. So anyway, that's, I'm gonna open the floor to, to uh, you guys. Norma, if you have something to say on Cambridge and then we can see what we can come up with here. Okay, thank you, Chair, uh, Councillor Ramsey. Um, I did receive a call and uh, what the resident did say, and I've traveled down that street a number of times since I received the call to check. Um, she indicated that on both sides of the street, there are vehicles parking, which causes difficulty in seeing with some young children uh, trying to back out onto the street or turn into the to the driveway, uh, but also in further discussion, uh, looking at some of the, the the street area, there's not a lot of parking in the driveways. Like say if some families have two vehicles, there's not a lot of room there uh, to put two vehicles. And I would think that sometimes that's what's happening is people are trying to find places to park. So I indicated to her, I would send it in and leave that to the direction of our CAO and director of police services, just to, you know, have a look at it and see if there could be any type of, uh, you know, effort or, or, or uh, an opinion on it. Because I do think that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look at it in fairness of both sides, people who do have to park on the street, uh, it might take away from their needs. But also, as a matter of fact, if there is some harm or problem with visibility, then, you know, possibly that needs to be looked at. I'm not sure. I'm not a professional in that area. So I'm, I'm just leaving that with our police services and chief as well as CAO to give us some direction. Can I make just a comment on that too, uh, uh, Madam Chair Ramsey? Mm -hmm. uh, I just, these are just my personal opinions. I, I think, uh, first of all, if you're going to be set up parking on one side of the street, half of the people on one side would want it on the other side and the other half would want it on their side. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people, we've lived through one of these a number of years ago and it was a hot potato. And I think uh, somebody, if you're taking parking space right out in front of somebody's home that they're used to for 20 years or 30 years, mm -hmm. also you'll have uh, oil trucks that will have to stop for 10 or 15 minutes to, to refuel a home. Uh, certain streets there, there are school buses and then they have disabled students that it takes a little longer to uh, get them onto the bus and off of the bus and they have to stop. I think uh, with the regulations we have like uh, and Chief Party is there, I mean they're only allowed to park so close to a corner and those kinds of things but right. uh, who decides on what side of the street you they want the parking on? I think it would be a can of worms but uh, I think it, it would probably, when the police are doing their patrolling, they can keep an eye on that sort of thing. But to, to make no parking on, on every street and on, on, no si on one side, uh, somebody might think it's a great idea as long as it's on the other side of the street. So and that's just my thought. Thank I can't you. win on that one, I don't think. Thank you, Mayor. I guess one of the questions I would have then for, for Chief um, would be, there are a number of streets where there is parking just on one side, mine being one. And I'm just wondering, you know, how did they decide that in the beginning? Like what was the, you know, was there any particular reason for, are some streets like more narrow? This one doesn't seem any more narrow than a lot of streets in Summerside. So I just wonder why that, that Good would be. Good question, but it probably started 50 or, or more years ago. I don't know. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, you're, you're both right in, in that it did start probably 50 years ago. And uh, I, I don't recall any lately. I think it might have been Ottawa Street where the, the plows had trouble getting by when when uh, vehicles were parked on both sides of the street. Uh, that was one of the streets that was made, no parking on one side. Uh, and Deputy Mayor McComan, you're right in, in, uh, in uh, people uh, parking on the street. We, we've advised some people that, you know, and they do park on their lawns in the wintertime to get the cars off the street because they're so used to having two or three vehicles. And uh, uh, this, is a, this uh, is a big issue, no doubt about it. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I just to, to kind of add into that, um, I'm just wondering because I know that it has happened in this ward back a number of years ago where the parking was changed and it really it did create problem for some of the residents who did park on the street. And yet by the same token, uh, the person who, you know, what didn't want the parking uh, does not live here year round. So now that parking has impacted on the street, but that person doesn't live here, like does summers here. And I think it was something that the residents really were offended by because they did try to, to do it seriously. They, they tried to be very conscious of the regulations. And yet again, when there are some, some residents that speak to safety concerns as well, like it really puts us as a council in a very awkward situation. And I think that's why we need the, you know, the, the advice uh, of police services, just to kind of give, give some thought to that and, and advise back to us. Certainly, uh, Deputy Mayor McCollum, when you look at it, I know last year we had an issue, I believe it was on Chestnut, a bit of a complaint with people parking on both sides. So I had uh, Fire Chief uh, Ron up to have a look at it made some measurements and uh, he indicated that his biggest fire truck would be able to get by if they're parked on both sides. So there was nothing done with that certain street. And I agree, certain streets are narrower. I don't have that list. I mean, uh, Director Aaron would have that list uh, probably in his department. Uh, certainly every street would have to be looked at. And normally in if you're making no parking on one side, usually you uh, make it an opposite of the sidewalk. If there's a sidewalk on that street, you, you leave the parking on the sidewalk side. People with birthday parties too and Christmas parties, uh, it just causes a, a storm that uh, that uh, I think we can get into that trying to sort out work side of the streets and everything else. Just my, my opinion. And I just think that some people find it dangerous on certain streets and those are the ones that are calling us, you know. Um, so I guess that's why I thought we should at least talk about it and um, maybe Dave, you guys could investigate and, and see what on some streets that uh, we've referred to, like Highland and um, Highland and Cambridge, I think. And then uh, Councillor Snow, you have something? Yeah, uh, to uh, Chief Fourier's point, uh, the street he was talking about was one uh, up in my ward that uh, some residents brought it forward with concerns. Uh, a lot of times around the school traffic where uh, vehicles would be parked on both sides. Um, and he, they went up and they measured and determined that it wouldn't be an issue that they're, so I would guess I'd recommend that anytime we're having those issues or if any residents have those concerns to reach out and let us know because the last thing we want is for our emergency vehicles not to be able to get to their destination because vehicles are parked on both sides. We, we might make somebody angry, but it's a decision we have to make for the safety of the community. And at the end of the day, that's, that's best for everybody. So, but uh, yeah, so if there's any of those streets to basically get out, measure them, make sure that we, it's sufficient parking if vehicles are on both sides and the emergency vehicles can get down. So whatever our largest fire truck is or our largest emergency vehicle that it can access the houses. So that, that's all I have to say. So I guess what you're saying, Councillor Snow, is just to kind of put it out there to the folks if if if, if our residents feel like the streets might be too narrow and there's double parking. Then right, maybe. right. Yeah. Yeah. So so you guys have have identified a few today that residents reached out to you. Uh, so either Chief Dave and or technical services, whoever can head out and do some measurements and realize if you know if it's a legitimate concern or or 
we can actually uh, get to those houses if there were an emergency. So. Certainly, uh, we will, uh, Aaron and I probably will uh, look at that in the next uh, few uh, weeks, actually. And we'll start with Cambridge and Highland and, like you said, do some measurements and invite uh, Chief uh, Fire Chief Ron up as well. I would suggest, uh, Chief, that if you're going to, and I'm not saying you are, but if somebody's going to have parking removed from the front of their home that they've had for the last 30 or 40, 50 years, uh, rather than just go up some morning and put no parking, I think the people should be talked to and, and at least advised, number one, but uh, maybe they, I, I would kind of doubt that you'll get permission from them. No, you're absolutely right, Your Worship. Well, one thing just to keep in mind is that all our streets are designed to a certain standard and and those standards are laid out, right? And, the, and you know, other than some abnormalities over the course of the years where maybe somebody's requested no parking, um, if there's parking currently permitted on both sides of the street, it's, it's a fairly good bet that the street was designed appropriately to that standard to allow it, right? Okay. Uh, I, I agree 100%, Gordon, but uh, for, and it, it will take some time, obviously, but I, I think if we have residents that are legitimately concerned, like that, you know, I'm, I'm worried if, you know, there's two vehicles on both sides, the ambulance is not going to get to me. Um, I, I think it's a worthwhile practice just to sort of relieve some of those concerns if we can. That I guess that's what I, but I totally agree. They're probably all, all built to standard. Yeah, and just uh, to follow up on Councillor Snow's point, we certainly will, uh, as a first step, uh, as Chief Dave has mentioned, that we will take a look at Highland and Cambridge, uh, so at least we can try to assuage the concerns, hopefully, of uh, residents in that area, and we'll circle back with you to let you know. And could you add a North Market into that, just, um, well, or maybe that's been addressed? Um, we'll take a look, yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so if that's... Um, Thank that, you. You have another item, uh, Councilor. I, I do. I do. Um, oh my goodness, you guys! <laughs> I've got too much going on here. Rufus, I believe. Yes, the other one is Rufus, and thank you, Basil. You've got that in front of you, and it's um, it's a stop, uh, no parking um, in front of um, the gentleman on the corner of uh, Water and Rufus Street. Um, his driveway and his walkway is right across from uh, the ice cream establishment. And um, since that ice cream establishment opened, it becomes very, very busy there. And um, which is wonderful for, for that business. But anyway, it blocks it. They park right in front of his, or right beside his home. And it's not even so much that it would bother him. If someone comes around the corner, there's nowhere for them to go. They're going to run into him because the cars are coming out of the uh, sunnies and, and um, going right up to the stop sign. So um, Chief uh, Poirier and I spoke today and we talked about maybe putting no parking there in that particular area, um, even from the end of May when, or when sunnies does open until it closes for five or six months. And then that way, cause that's really the only time you would have vehicles parked there. Um, so, uh, I guess, is that Dave, what you were? Yeah, Councillor Ramsey, there was also an issue with vehicles turning that were heading, uh, west on Water Street and turning onto Rufus when the cars were parked uh, close to the corner. Oh, for sure. They will, that's an accident waiting to happen. Yeah. Because they park right there, you know, two or three cars and then they run over to Sonny's and, uh, and I it's think in, in the original uh, recommendation, I'd ask for two parking spots be eliminated but uh, maybe a, a time the uh, time thing like you said from May to September or something yeah yeah and, and this was already approved last year uh, folks and then we and then we went ahead and put the sidewalk in so we put everything on hold until the sidewalk was in but anyway now that it's there um, we're just kind of uh, going back to it and and I spoke to the gentleman and he's really looking forward to the signs going up and uh, you know because yeah it's it's not a good situation there right now Yes. So, Councillor Ramsey, if this is approved, uh, I guess it is, uh, we will certainly need an, a resolution to be done up, and which I pass on to Director Gregg uh, for your staff. Okay. I thought we did that last year. 
We do. <laughs> we do. Why would we need another one? No. I don't know if there's ever a resolution passed, though. I thought there was. Yeah, we don't. Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor McDougall and uh, Madam Chair, uh, we don't have a record of a resolution actually being passed. And I guess purpose of tonight was if, or purpose of discussing this item right now is that if council is still supportive of this re request, which it sounds like uh, they are, then we would proceed to have this uh, put on the, the monthly uh, council meeting for final approval and get it done there. The only um, question I do have for all members of council, uh, is this a, a permanent change that you would want contemplated or one based on the season as suggested by, uh, by uh, Madam Chair? And I'm just asking the question. Um, I, I was just going to say, I don't see the value in doing it seasonally if we're eliminating spaces when they're most needed in that area. And do you know what I mean? If we're going to do it, we might as well do it because nobody's going to park there from November till anyway. So you might as well just put it, no parking, leave it, and then it's done as opposed to eliminating it when the business there or people going to the business utilize those parking spots. But I, I agree totally with uh, eliminating the spots, I just don't see the benefit of doing it seasonally. I guess. What about what about people visiting him? It might uh, he might want <laughs> that time of year. The one that doesn't uh, want them. He's no. the one that he's the one that wants them eliminated. So at the end, of, yeah, you gotta. I, I hear what you're saying, Your Worship, but <laughs> yeah, what you wish for. Yeah. Oh, it's it's not a good place to park. Period. Like if you're coming around that corner, it's 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 right. The vehicles are right there. So if he did have company, they could park on the other side of the street, like everybody else that would be. If there was no parking on that side, they would park on the other side. Park at Sunny. Yeah, and it would just be a matter of someone getting out of their car <laughs> and going walking over to across the street, like they do if they come here to visit me, right? So anyway, um, Brian, Councillor Brian, sorry, go ahead. Oh, your mic's on, Brian. Your mic is on, Brian. Your mic is off. You're on mute there. There we go. Okay. Oh, you're you're muted again, Brian. Oh, you're muted again. Muted again, Brian. Brian, you're muted. Found in the other Brian. Yeah. How was that? Yeah, okay. Uh, I guess just to reiterate what other folks are saying, I, I, I think if you're going to do it, do it permanently. I mm -hmm. think that corner, like for snow removal, even for a cloud to come around that that corner there, uh, uh, and there's plenty of parking further up the street or across the street to satisfy their local needs. So uh, I would certainly support the motion coming to council at the next meeting and uh, and uh, make it happen. Okay. Just to confirm, uh, members of council, uh, that was only the request was only for two parking spots, so an extra maybe forty feet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, so what happens there, and I, and I'll tell you. So if you did the two parking spots, then you're into Felix's driveway, and you're into the next gentleman's driveway. So it it will be end up being that whole block. It's just a short, there's just two houses on the block. Well, uh, I believe uh, the resident only asked for two at first. So I don't know if you want to go further. It's up to council. No, but that's what I'm saying to you, uh, Chief. I think if you put two in, then, then next is his driveway anyway, and then next is the other gentleman's driveway. So you would end up, it would be quite a distance with, with no parking there. Okay. Would the two include the, so many feet from the corner anyway? Is that classed as one of them? Uh, no, Your Worship, there would be an automatic, uh, I believe, 15 feet or five meters uh, that would we can't park there anyway. So, so to answer Councillor Ramsey's prob or question, that would be one and then there'd be one more after that? No, that, that wouldn't include. There'd be two parking spots separate and apart from that 15 feet to the corner. So the, the house next to that, Councillor Ramsey, would they be in favor of this? They're taking their spot away from the front of their home. They don't have anything there. They had, it's just their driveway. And they, they have a big double driveway, like they have a four car driveway. They have a so double driveway with two two vehicles that would go in each. So would uh, we ever put a, a no parking in front of the driveways or? No. Uh, your worship, we usually don't, that's up to the homeowner. Yeah. 
Yeah, that wouldn't, in, yeah, that wouldn't include us. So, okay then. So I move motion that we take this to the council meeting, I guess, on, on the uh, 15th, what's the date of our next council, 15th? 15th of June. It is the 15th, isn't it? Yep. 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 That may be a real meeting rather than these uh, Zoomies. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Ramsey. So that's all I have for police. Would oh, you have fire too? Please fire. Yep. That's all on your committee, is it? Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll continue on here. We'll get the agenda going again. And we're going to move on to municipal services. Councillor McDougall. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I would call the meeting to order. And uh, we just have one item on the agenda, it's 3D crosswalks. And I know the staff was asked to do some work on this. I, I believe uh, Director Greg is there. And I know uh, Councillor Justin had submitted some information. So maybe I'll turn it over to Councillor Greg. Or Councillor Greg, I'm sorry, Director Greg Goody. Good evening, Council and Your Worship. The, um, so the work on the 3D um, crosswalk, um, if you allow me to share the screen for a second here, I'll just give you a quick rundown of what it entails to make one. And then I'll give you an idea of, I'll open the floor up for the rest of you have a discussion on which ones, which crosswalks and see if there's any input from public on where they thought they might like to see the application done. Um, Oh, I can't share the screen. Okay, so on on that item, there's a um, I can send around to council a article on how to create one, so you get an idea on, on the effort. But it would take um, a fair amount of time to create one, and probably a traffic disruption of the full area for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, reason for that is you take a basically a a photo spot in the center of the road, and then you do angles of perspective each side of the crosswalk and in both directions if it's a dual directional roadway. So it will take quite a bit of time to do and, and probably think at least a morning or longer to do the application in the roadway. So that's something to consider when you pick the locations for, for how we do that. The second- sorry, oh, sorry, Greg, I think you're, you're able to share now. I just changed your permission okay. there. All right, thanks. Mark. Can everybody see that screen? Yeah. So how to lay a uh, stripe of floating crosswalk. So this was an article actually in a public works magazine on how to do it. So if you can see there, you, and I won't go through it in a lot of detail, but the point of the, is you take a point in the middle of the roadway uh, out a certain point from the crosswalk. And that's the first section you do. And then the next section you just draw these, you draw these perspective lines, just like the old geometry glasses, I guess. And from there, you start creating the shadow effect on the crosswalk blocks and it's quite a process to start going down you take you start taking chalk lines across the road and you set up your perspective lines to paint and you can see the different points they use here to create what they call these shadow boxes and continue on with the layout until you get into the painting and you can see this is an application of all the lines marked on the road and you start painting the small boxes around the regular crosswalk. So what happens then is you start getting into the painting of it and you can see the different shades of gray um, and then the shadow of the box beneath it. So at the end of the day, what you get is a similar effect is similar to this, which is <laughs> looks like it actually gets bumped out on the road for those motorists. It is, it is not seeable in, in the dark. Um, it, uh, the effect goes away. Obviously, you need light to show the shadow effect on the painting. So, but just to give you an idea of the process and the time it takes to make one, it would probably be, I'm guessing, maybe a full day process or, or maybe, and it would, would dictate at least cutting off half the roadway to do one side and then half the other side. Carrie, Carrie would want that. They should start at eight in the morning, wouldn't you say, Carrie? <laughs> <laughs> So that's just a, that's just a quick uh, snapshot of how one's created. So we we've, we've looked at the method of how to do it, and we're ready to do it. It's just a matter of where council and the public might want to try a couple applications. Greg, this should be a fairly flat street too, right? 
Yeah, it's uh, it's it's better for viewing angles for the traveling public to see the effect as they come come up to it. A lot of people trip over that. Yes. So. Uh, that's what I have for that's what I have for council and and uh, your worship to discuss on the that's the application of how it looks and then you just need to give staff direction on where you might like to try something. Okay. Councillor Adams. Um, just to reply to your worship, yes, like after nine o'clock on a main artery would be great, preferred. Um, just one thing, can you tell us, um, we had people comment that this would be an additional cost. Is the paint, is it a different type of paint that has to be used or is it paints of different shades to get this effect? Yeah, Therefore. So no additional cost. There's a small amount of additional cost. You'd have to get uh, three extra paint colors from the white. So there's a, a light gray, a dark gray, and a black that you, that uh, that goes along with the white top of the crosswalk kind of block, I'll say. And the real the real increase in cost is time. It just takes a lot longer to do one, and will take probably flaggers and multiple people to, to execute such a such an elaborate paint job. But I think it's doable, and if it's maintained to a select few spots to see how it goes. I think it's doable within the current budget structure of the city of Summerside for this summer. And I just, uh, I just had a couple follow-ups. I know that I, in my ward, we do have an issue with Water Street East on too small. Um, it's an issue there and there's many places in the city, but that's one that I get a lot of calls on. Now there is a left turning lane going in there. So that's why I didn't put it to a list uh, on the list of areas because um, after talking to a few residents, I felt that that might be a little too busy with a left turn lane and the overhead lights. And then this, it might just cause a little too much confusion for drivers. Um, yeah, so that was, that was really it and just, oh. Councilor Ron, do you did you have something? Um, nothing additional. I mean, I have my list, I guess, that I compiled from the missions that came in. Um, and I like I, I sent an email around earlier, and I just mentioned that I tried to filter out the ones that people requested as more of a, a gimmick, like oh, it would be neat to have here, and and kind of try to narrow it down to to ones that were more useful. Um, like a lot of the places that you have cars just totally going by people trying to cross and so locations like that but uh, as far as anything to add just just a few locations like, like like other people may have okay thanks councillor mcfeely and then councillor ramsey Hi. chief dave, dave councillor bruce yes i see that you're muted again, Brian. Uh, Brian, you're muted. There okay. you go. There we go. Um, how many are we considering, Director Greg? Uh, are we looking at a couple or three or four or one or? I thought I thought a good recommendation would be a maximum of, of three locations, okay. kind of give enough uh, quantity for to spread around the community. Sounds good. Okay. Councillor Barb and then count and then Director Dave. And that was my question. How many were we considering? And then I think I, I guess one of the things we talked about was um, just putting them like at the school at the school zones. And you know, I thought that was something that we talked about initially. So um, I guess with school not happening, that may not be. But anyway, we always have September to look forward to. So yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I was just going to suggest that if we're looking for a, a test spot, a good one would be on Water Street at Spring, where there's no uh, where the lights were removed. There, that's a very mm -hmm. busy intersection with the home mm -hmm. building and the bank across, and right. we we'll get a good indication of the traffic flow. What's yeah. the CIBC corner. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The flags are there. Yeah, we put the flags there. Uh, Corey. Uh, just just a couple things. Uh, one place I would suggest, just because hopefully once uh, things get going here, it'll be busy, would be that uh, uh, park uh, across from, oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. 
uh, <laughs> where we have our splash pad. I'm just drawing a blank. Sorry, guys. Uh, and then, uh, yes, Lejeune. And, and the other thing I was thinking is we have some, uh, I, I spoke with Rob the other day, um, and there's a few sections without, within the city where uh, we move from just our standard block uh, crosswalks to lines. So mainly along Water Street, and then we get to basically in front of the boardwalk on Water Street uh, West uh, by Sunny's and that stretch where we go just to the straight lines. And, and if you're driving along there, you're, you know, you're seeing a blocked crosswalk, block, crosswalk, block, crosswalk. And then all of a sudden it changes to a different style crosswalk, basically along the same stretch. And, and as a driver, I, I found it very confusing. And I, it's something I just noticed the other day, cause I, I knew the guys were out doing some painting and, and, as I was driving, I noticed the change of the side of the crosswalks and something I asked Rob sort of the reason behind. And I know there was a, a study done years ago with, you know, different crosswalks and different zones, but I, I would request not to sort of sidebar this, but I would request we consider putting those block ones in because I, I find it has quite a difference in that area. And then uh, we can definitely the 3D zones. There's probably lots of locations, but I would recommend maybe doing it in, an area where we can, you know, get some really good numbers back. So I'd be happy to try it anywhere, really. Yeah. Okay. Deputy Mayor? Uh, just one area uh, that that is busy is the area around uh, Spinnakers and Harbor Drive along that area when the cars uh, gain momentum. Sometimes you will see people trying to cross there. And uh, it's fine if the lights are there, but sometimes they're crossing in other areas where there's no lights. So... Just food for thought. Uh, Basil and then Councillor John. Okay, yeah, just a quick thought here. And Councillor Campbell mentioned it the other day and the North McEwen Road there where that new development is going and uh, infrastructure have to be upgraded to get across and Craig Avenue, there's a lot of pedestrians up there now in that not only for this new development, but the other apartment complexes just before that. So that may be another suggestion. And uh, I would think I think Greg had mentioned that it's going to take a whole day to paint it. Yeah. Uh, what about a Sunday? Uh, versus, uh, you know, versus a heavy traffic day, if it's going to be a whole day. Anyway. That is, that is, that is definitely a possibility. Yeah. Councilor Jerome? Um, yeah, I guess just to throw out what, uh, what came into me, of course, the first one, uh, like Chief, uh, Poirier mentioned was the corner at CIBC uh, water and spring uh, due to the fact that there's no light and it's so common for people to be standing there and then cars just to whiz by. Um, another couple were where the trails cross so at, on Greenwood and more so probably heavier traffic on south and then uh, in front of Sunny's was another one um, and I think uh, yeah, it was Councillor uh, McFeely and I were having this quick chat earlier today and uh, it was at the corner of Carroll and McEwen. It's where the current crosswalk crosses over McEwen Road. Uh, yes. Those were the, those yeah. were the short handful that came into me. Okay. Thank you. Councillor McFeely. Uh, I guess just to put my oar in the water on the McEwen Road one and, and um, the McEwen Road, the, the sidewalk is on one side of the road and then it switches over to the other side of the road. And there's a fair amount of pedestrian traffic on that. So they have to cross the road. And if you will recall, I think the last two uh, instances where, where people were hitting crosswalks, one was the death that happened at Tim Horton's corner there. And we did some alterations to that corner. The second last one was on that crosswalk at McEwen Road where a gentleman was, was hit, he wasn't killed, but he was severely uh, injured. Um, uh, I think the crosswalk does two things. It allows the pedestrians to cross, but crosswalks are also used to attempt to slow down traffic. And McEwen Road is a stretch of traffic from Water Street right up to Walker uh, with no stop signs, no nothing to impede speeding and there's significant speeding that happens there. Uh, so I, I would uh, encourage 
um, the Cuban Road, uh, and preferably, I, I don't know if it's Carroll or Lafergy where it crosses there, but one of those streets, um, I, I think would be a good location. Councillor Campbell? I'll have to agree with mine on that one. It's probably a better, better place to take a sample would be it up where Brian's talking about. I think you get down on Craig, it's too close to the corner with the flash and stop signs of Walker, the thing, and don't be, <laughs> too much traffic, everybody goes too fast up at my place for any of it to work. So I'd have to agree with, uh, with Councillor McFeely. That would be a better place to take a sample. Okay, did everybody chime uh, in? How's Greg going to decide? We gave him seven or eight well, different options. Well, I think the uh, three. I think what we all agree with that uh, we all agree that uh, we do three uh, this year for a trial, and uh, you know between our police force, our CAO, our tech services, and municipal works, I think they have a, a good idea of where we'd like them, and uh, maybe they can come back with and tell us their thoughts on where they should go. I could, I could give you some opinions right now from listening to the group talk. I heard okay. three major important, important ones. One was uh, child protection, which is near the splash pad on Central Street, I assume. That one would be, I think, a good recommendation for this year. Yeah. The second one was for tra for some suspected traffic. Thumbing would be one on McEwen Road this year, uh, somewhere along there that we can pick. And the final one is probably more in the Greenwood and South area where the trail has a lot of traffic for bicycles and things. I think those would be three good starting points for this year. Yeah. The only reason I say that is because the other ones uh, have some things already going on for them, whether they be flags or actuated crosswalks that are already accentuated. So those are the three I would recommend. Okay. For this year. Everybody okay with that? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. All right. It, um, just one last thing, Bruce, it'll be interesting to see, uh, what comes out of it for traffic calming, like uh, Council McFeely said, whether or not it, you know, tends to slow traffic down a little bit. Because I, I do agree with Council McFeely when you have crosswalks and pedestrian pathways, it tends to throw, uh, slow traffic. So that that'll be a sort of side benefit of it. So thanks. Okay, uh, Chief. Yeah, just one more point, uh, Councilor, if you don't mind. Uh, the accident that uh, Council McFeely brought up on Water Street, where a gentleman was killed. The just gentleman was not in the crosswalk. He yeah. just crossed the street at the mid. At the oh, mid I, my, my apologies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, is that it? I thank everyone for their input and uh, we'll uh, move along. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, uh, Councillor Matogo. Councillor Snow, uh, you have the community services report. Is your director on air tonight, JP? I don't see him. Anyway, Councillor Snow. Uh, JP is not here tonight. We only have uh, one thing on the agenda, and it's East Prince Seniors Initiative. So uh, basically, uh, I'm just giving a quick update on where we are with everything. As as uh, uh, we all know, uh, EPSI has uh, disbanded. We got notice from the board, uh, and council at this time has decided to entrust uh, community services JP and his staff to uh, draft a terms of reference to come back to council which we are hoping to have uh, early fall and from there we're looking to engage with the senior groups around the city so Parkview uh, former members of EPSI and and the age-friendly community and and try to create a, a new uh, seniors initiative here in the city that uh, will address some of the uh, needs of our senior population. Um, I, I mainly, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, EPSI for their many years of work within the city. Uh, they've done great work and, and from their work, we'll uh, build a new platform that uh, will address the needs of our seniors. So, um, and also uh, thank you and uh, well wishes to Gloria Skirman, who, uh, as we all know, recently had a, heart attack and uh, she, she's uh, healing and, and getting back to normal. So uh, I just want to wish everybody uh, well wishes to her and uh, all the best. So um, that that's basically it. It was just a, sort of an update to let people know where we're going with this and, and uh, looking forward to engaging the community to uh, come with our new senior focus task force and, and the path forward. 
Thank you, Councillor Snow. That's all that's on the agenda. I would open it up for any councillors if they have any comments or questions. I just, just, had, a com just a comment. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Carrie. I just had one um, thing. I just wanted to do a, a shout out to all our families, our children, and anybody that uses our green spaces now that phase three started and they're reopened. Um, they're back there. The park was, was busy. They weren't over their 20 max, but it was, you could definitely hear that they were happy to be back. And we appreciate, um, city, city staff appreciated everybody's cooperation because it was something that, you know, we were new at it and um, everybody, everybody did so well. Like we had comments on how everybody abided by the regulations put in place and that, that got us where we are today. We're moving ahead quickly. So thank you to everybody that cooperated with us. Yeah, it was uh, it was a great scene uh, seeing all the kids uh, in the parks on Monday, and and uh, it'll just uh, get better as we continue to move forward. Councillor Campbell, oh, I just said I it was myself that asked to have the EPSI put on the agenda. I had a a couple of things I'd like to share with the councillors. Maybe we can do that in the committee of a whole afterwards. It's, it's not it only take a second. Yeah, I think EPSI had a meeting yesterday, and they're continuing. Down the road that they're going on. Anyway. That sounds good. Sounds good, Councillor Campbell. Councillor McCollman. You are there. You uh, go. Got it. Um, I just also wanted just to make a comment because I know that there were some posts with regards to EPSI. And I guess being the finance chair, uh, where we worked very hard as a council with the community grants that did come in over $800,000. I do want to clarify, just as you've said, Councillor Snow, that um, certainly it was something that council took uh, a very, very um, involved approach to looking at all of the different things, all of the comments that we've heard from seniors personally. And just to echo what you said about uh, thanking uh, EPSI and Age Friendly because they've, they've built a legacy. Uh, but one of the things that we really wanted to make sure of is that there were other seniors group that were included that provide programs and services. And I think that was one of the reflections that we had not to uh, give the impression to people that we don't care for seniors because we care very, very much. But we saw that they were asking for different services and programs, and it became very clear to council that we had to really look at all of those things to be inclusive. So. I just wanted to clarify that uh, we're very much for seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Uh, definitely, uh, I totally hear exactly what you're saying. Uh, anybody, any further questions, comments as uh, we close out here in community services? Just, uh, I know it's been out on social media, but uh, you're doing some opening of the credit union place and, and uh, just want to comment on the parks there for anybody that's listening and what's open and what's not open and how it's going to be open. You, you're, say that uh, again, Your Worship, oh, you broke up. Well, Credit Union Place has uh, started to be open and portions of it and uh, the same with the parks, if you just yep. want to comment on that, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, so so with the June 1st uh, phase three opening, we, we started the, of opening the parks and the ball fields and community services. Um, so we're following all the CPHO, Chief Public Health Officer uh, requirements that we have to to open our facility safety, safely and, and we've been on that path. I spoke with uh, Director JP yesterday and he, he said uh, Credit Union Place definitely isn't as busy as it normally is, but there was some uh, residents starting to come in and, and use their uh, gym and walking track and so on. Um, the, at Credit Union Place, uh, right now, the pool is currently closed as we're uh, uh, doing retiling there, um, but uh, the other facilities have opened. Um, all our parks are open with the requirements of the CPHO, so uh, signage has been put up so our residents uh, know what they're uh, required to do to follow those directions, and uh, it, it's been, uh, like we said earlier, it's been great seeing the kids out playing and and getting back to some normalcy. Uh, ball fields are opening up. Uh, Chevy started their tryouts on Monday and, 
and uh, the, our ball field is looking amazing. There's been lots of images shared online, and and uh, we we definitely have some of the greatest facilities around, and, and something we should all be very proud of, and our our residents in our city should be proud of. So so everything's starting to open up your worship uh, gradually, and uh, the main thing is that our residents uh, get out and active, but uh, follow the uh, CPHO directions and uh, guidelines we have out. Thank you, and I just uh, know it's a uh, sort of community services, but it's in your area too. But I just want to mention uh, the racetrack and the racing industry. Uh, I know um, we're working on that this week, and uh, we're going to be talking with a number of people. But uh, I know that I don't think the governor's plate uh, or the uh, gold cup has been cancelled. And I, as far as I know, and I was talking to some people today in the racing business, and they said other racetracks in the Maritimes. I'm not sure how many there are, but I have an opening date, but there's none set yet for the Summerside Racetrack. And uh, so we'll be working on that just to find out exactly what's going on. And I would hope that we can still have the governor's plate, even though it may be later. And I was understand today too, that uh, that uh, Charlottetown, uh, they can have uh, seating now in the grandstands and if reservations are made. So if that's the case there, we should be able to have the same thing here, I would think. And I understand they marked the, the six feet for the standing audience if anybody's going in there. That's what I was advised today. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but we'll work on that this week and uh, keep everybody posted. And if any of the councillors uh, have anything uh, to, to help out, it'd certainly be greatly appreciated. That's all yes, you, yes, you worship the uh, horse industry in Summerside and Raceway Park. Uh, Raceway is very important to. Uh, the city and we hopefully will have uh, some races there this summer and and definitely long into the future so uh it, it we look forward to as things loosen up here uh, provincially wise with the uh, the restrictions and I, I hopefully we get a little clearer clearer picture of where we go with that so yeah i, I don't know how it, i guess things got changed over the years but i understand now the president of the prince county horseman club is from moncton new brunswick now, how that happened, I got no idea. And I understand, you know, I, I think it's a lady and a very fine person, likely, but it seems like to have a president of our horseman's club from from uh, Prince County, the, the, the chair from Moncton, uh, I, we'll get all that sorted out this week, but it's an unusual situation. And uh, we got to get some, uh, get some, get behind the wheel here and give our, our horsemen and the horsewomen uh, our shoulder to push to get get our fair share yes your worship uh any any further questions comments we close out community services uh thank you your worship that's all for community ser services i move for, to, for adjournment thank you councillor snow and i believe councillor adams you have the floor for human resources and legal affairs and all that good stuff the floor is yours councillor adams um thank you and I just, I, there was just the one thing and it was meeting protocol and that was put on by um, actually Councillor McFeely um, wanted to go over that. So maybe Brian, will I just pass it over to you? You're good? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't, I don't even know if that's the, the proper title for what I want to talk about. But anyways, that's, that's what came out. Um, and I have a little presentation just to give some background to this I, we've had a few meetings recently that you know have been relatively lengthy five and a half hours well past our 10 o'clock uh, uh, legislative adjournment time uh, so I know a few councillors had mentioned to me some frustration I guess I could call it around that I've had some discussions with with the mayor and the mayor said, well, let's just put it on the agenda and we'll have a chat. So just to kind of give it a little bit of focus, I did put a little presentation together and the Brian, hopefully you can, can get that up. Um, and uh, we, I'll just go through it very, very quickly here. I noticed my computer's telling me I'm in low battery now. So uh, it's gonna be real quickly. Um, okay, I'll just go through this very quickly and uh, um, so that's a little bit of the background and really the motivation for the presentation so we can go to the next slide Brian so the, the purpose and 
objectives are, you know, to really respond to those comments and the length of some of the recent meetings. And some of the concerns that I've heard uh, from the public about, you know, what the committee of the whole, what goes on in the committee of the whole, how come we're in committee, you know, the number of agenda items in the committee of the whole and stuff like that. So, so the objective really is to explore options to keep meetings efficient, uh, seek agreement from council on actions going forward and sort of briefly discuss transparency and opus, openness as it relates to the committee of the whole. Um, next slide, Ryan. So really kind of went back and looked at with a, our enabling acts and bylaws, the Municipal Government Act, the City of Summerside Procedural Bylaw, and the City of Summerside Code of Conduct Policy and and uh, you know those are the rules and guidelines that that, that we need to go by. And uh, you know for the public's information, they may think we kind of make the rules up as we go along, but but it, it's very controlled what we're able to do and, and what we're allowed to do. And those those are the sort of uh, enabling acts and bylaws that allow us to do what we do. Next slide, Brian. Uh, so the Municipal Government Act really defines council's role as, a, as, a, as in our role as in policy and developing good public policy. Uh, council's only employee is the CAO, and that's defined in, in that, that, you know, we as councillors have absolutely no authority over other staff and have no right to be directing other staff in any way, shape or form. Uh, and that's defined in the Municipal Government Act. Uh, enables council to exercise authority uh, in two ways, through bylaws, the development of bylaws, and by resolutions. Uh, defines closed meetings in, in section 119-1. Defines what we're allowed to go into closed meetings for and what we can do in those closed meetings. And it defines that there's only three kinds of motions permitted in closed meetings. And so, you know, I think it's good for the public to understand the only thing we can do in closed meetings is give instructions to our lawyer around legal affairs, give instructions to the individual negotiating contracts, and give direction to staff on HR matters. Uh, matters. Uh, uh, anything else that's discussed and closed, any decisions that are made need to be brought back into the public forum and voted on in public. So. Uh, the bylaws, the Municipal Act restricts us from doing anything behind closed doors. We need to come to the public and, um, and pass a resolution that defines what we want to do. Next slide, Brian, please. Uh, so the procedural bylaw already sets out how we do business. It contemplates that we follow Robert's rules of order. Uh, it requires that the agenda be set a minimum of two business days before each meeting. And any changes to the agenda requires unanimous approval. And that, that when I was going through this, that kind of reminded me that I needed to get unanimous approval to add to, uh, something to the agenda tonight. And it defines 10 p.m. as our time limit that we need to be adjourned by 10 p.m. Uh, next slide, Brian. Let me get through this before my battery goes. Uh, code of conduct. Uh, it, there's a number of guiding principles in there, but two kind of pertinent to tonight is the, you know, members of council must conduct public business efficiently um, and, and with decorum, must treat each other and others with respect. And I think it's really important that, uh, you know, regardless of how we may feel about things that, that you know, we're treating uh, people who come before us, uh, members of the public, developers, whoever with the, with the respect uh, they deserve. Uh, we want people to understand that our, our city is open for, for business and, uh, and uh, that we welcome them here. Members of council have a duty to be open as possible about decisions and actions. This means communicating information uh, to the public about decision processes and issues being considered and encouraging appropriate public participation. Ryan. So just to talk about the community of the whole a little bit and uh, it's for the somewhat for the, the, the public's knowledge as, as well as our own um, that that by legislation we can go in the community the whole we need to go in the community the whole to protect people's interests uh, developers interests those types of things but I think we should always be cognizant about how much time we're spending in the community the whole so uh, with Ryan's help kind of did a quick analysis of the period from January to May in both 2019 and 2020. And 
this doesn't include other meetings. This is kind of our formal Tuesday night committee meetings and Monday night council meetings. We can see in 2019, we spend about 66% of our time in open meetings and about 34% of our time in, in closed meetings. In 2020, during that period, we we're almost 60% in open meetings and 40% in closed meetings. So there's, there's, and there's very good rationale for that. Uh, we've had a lot of development going on this year and, 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 a, and a, a lot of good discussion that needs to take place around contractual stuff and that type of thing. But I think we just need to be cognizant that it's important that we, uh, if we look at places that have really embarked on transparency kinds of policies, the city of Ottawa, for instance, one of their measures is each year they compare how much time they spend in community hall this year compared to last year and really working to see a downward trend as opposed to an upward trend. So, uh, it's something we just need, need to be cognizant about. And again, I would emphasize that, you know, there's some real good rationale why it's up a little bit this year, but, but it, you know, and I'm, I'm sure it'll go down as we move forward. And it's interesting, just the agenda items in May and June committee meetings, for example, we've had 16 items, agenda items that are on, in the public forum and 16 agenda items that are in the closed session. So, uh, assuming that we should be limiting the time we spend in closed session, maybe we need to be looking at that, that uh, ratio a little bit. So next slide, Brian. Uh, so propose, uh, just propose initiatives to make, uh, uh, make us look at uh, how we can make meetings a little more efficient. And, and I'm as guilty as everybody else on, on some of these. So I'm, I'm, I'm not preaching them because I'm, 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 I'm very much guilty of some of them. So, um, you know, but to start on time tonight, we were a little delayed because of me, uh, but just the technology, it wasn't me. Uh, I think we have a responsibility to come prepared that we've read the documents and, and, and we're, we, uh, we're, the staff have prepared, staff have taken in some instance significant time to uh, prepare documents for us. So I think we have a responsibility to come prepared and have those read. I think we need to be respectful of the staff's time. And maybe that's a little bit of agenda management that, you know, sometimes we have directors sitting here for hours waiting for, you know, 10 or 15 minute part of the agenda that they may have that maybe we manage that agenda a little better and allow them to, to do their part up front so that uh, they don't need to sit through the rest of it. I think we can re reduce the, the, the length of the break between the, uh, the public meeting and moving into the committee as a whole, you know, that's stretched well over a half hour on some occasions. Uh, and I, I think part of the class, and I don't want to suggest that the media are part of the problem because they certainly aren't. We want to be open and available to the media. But we have a media room outside of the council chambers and we have the board room here that I'm sitting in tonight uh, that, that we could the media could use to conduct those interviews as opposed to the council chambers. I think we should be able to proceed with Cal. We lost you, Brian, or Councillor McFeely. I think his battery probably just went dead. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, he's, he's just heading to someone else's office, I think. Okay. Don't use this office or rubs. Still got three hours before 10 o'clock. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Brian Harlock, you need to get us some nice music for when we're waiting. Elevator music. Bruce usually has guitars there and behind him. I got a few there. I'm just, I'm in the process of moving. <laughs> Oh, there we go. We got some speech. Yeah, I think we can. Uh, I, I think I don't know how others feel that we could proceed with committee of the whole, even though those interviews are happening and people can catch up and join in afterwards. Uh, and if it's something dear to their heart, uh, that particular agenda item, uh, we, we we can save that for later and tell the person's back in the room. Uh, I think single ward issues should be can be direct 
dealt directly with the CAO. Uh, and, and my experience has been that 99% of those will be resolved through the CAO and staff. And uh, it can't get resolved and then bring it to council by, by a resolution. Um, I think we need to follow the procedural bylaw. Uh, that non-agenda items uh, require unanimous support of the council to be to be added to an agenda. I think we should adhere to that 10 p.m. cutoff time, and the reason for that is that uh, you know after five hours, uh, I don't know if we're really giving the topic the, the attention it deserves. Right. If you're into a million dollar discussion, I don't really want to be making those kinds of decisions at after after a five hour meeting um if questionable whether an item should be in committee of the whole or in the public meeting I, I think that should be deferred to the public meeting if it's if it's if it's the, the nature of it is even being questioned i don't know why we would have it in committee of the whole um i think we could have robert's rules of order more closely adhered to and and respect the chair's position to acknowledge speakers and, and uh, respect the, uh, the rule of uh, speaking uh, once or twice to each item and then, and then dealing with the resolution and, and using resolutions better uh, uh, and more often to kind of get us to a decision as opposed to uh, debating and, and, and hearing the same old arguments over and over again from each of us. And, uh, and and not really getting to a decision point. So um, that is uh, kind of, uh, as I thought about this a little bit and talked to uh, the mayor and, uh, and a, few, a few folks as they could have expressed some concerns, uh, kind of put this together just to get people's thoughts and feelings on it. And maybe I'm off in left field. Thank you, Councillor McFeely. Uh, uh, Bruce, you're waving your hand. Yeah, I, uh, I, I want to thank Brian for putting this together and uh, staff, whoever helped. And uh, I had a question on uh, a question and a comment. The numbers of 66 and 33 or whatever percent, uh, was that based on time or was it based on items? It's based on time and start yeah. time to finish time of each meeting. Yeah, because I think if you really look at it, there's a whole lot less items go into. I think if we did it on items, uh, that numbers would be a whole lot higher about uh, the open concept. Because uh, I'm like the mayor, I've been around uh, a bit and I talk to a lot of people right across this country and I challenge uh, any community to be as open as this community is in Summerside. We, there's very few things that ever go in that go into uh, committee of the whole that, you know, I, I'm very uh, conscious of that. And every time there's something in there, I, I ask myself the same question. And 99% you know, of the time, uh, we don't have an issue with uh, what's gone in there. But uh, I, I, I just thank you for putting that together. And uh, not hurting my feelings any if you uh, keep it at 10 o'clock. Uh, I guess I would add, and I meant to cover that off in my preface there, but when I noticed my low battery going, <laughs> going <laughs> I moved a little too quickly, is I, I agree 100%. I don't think there's many municipalities across this country as open as we are. Uh, I believe uh, there are very few communities that do the financial reporting on a monthly basis that we do. And, and I, I wasn't presenting it as, as suggesting that we were doing anything in Committee of the Whole that we shouldn't have been doing. I was suggesting that, uh, uh, you know, the nature of some of the stuff that's been going on this year around development has required us to be in the Committee of the Whole, perhaps a little more than we would like to be. But uh, I agree with you 100%. I, I think we're as, as open as any municipality across this country, perhaps more open than 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 many. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that those were items and not uh, and those were time and not items because it paints a different picture. There were times they're not items, but if you look at the recent agendas, the items have been 
a trend towards a few more. So we've never been this busy before either. Exactly. One, it's just one technical thing, Brian. When you read off the rules, there was uh, the agenda had to be put together two days before, and all of our meetings are on the Monday of third Monday of the month. So that's things can be put on sometime on Friday afternoon, and you don't have any time to research it or get information on it because. You only have the one day that meeting is that Monday night then. Most of the time, I think the agenda comes out late Thursday or early Friday. Uh, I, I think the bylaw requires two business days. So I think, think we need to be caught. Yeah, that's what I mean, two business, yeah. well, two yeah. business days. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. And then something always pops up at the last minute that, you know, like you were saying there that I guess if you get majority support or the unanimous support, you can get it on the agenda because- yeah. There's always something falling out of the sky you can't see coming in this business. And I think that's why the provision is there for somebody to bring something forward if they have unanimous support. Thank you, Councillor McFeely. Uh, okay, Councillor McCollman, or Deputy Mayor McCollman. Hi, uh, Brian, Councillor Brian. Also, I want to thank you for, you know, taking the time to prepare that uh, information for us. And, and I appreciate what you're saying because I think we all need to hear that because sometimes we don't maybe think about it or whatever. And I think you've pointed it out really well, according to the policies that, you know, we really need to, to be aware of. And I think I've been one that ha has said sometimes, like I just find my mind is really foggy after about nine o'clock at night, trying to get things that are really, really important decisions for us. And I think when our meetings are starting at five o'clock, it's, you know, sometimes I don't know if people realize that we're spending as many hours in the meetings and we're really trying to do that due diligence piece. So I was glad that you brought that out. Um, another thing I think that we always need to be reminded of is with the Freedom of Information Act and the Municipal Government Act. Uh, sometimes we think that, you know, we might be able to change something or make a decision, but I think that they're very clear in pointing out that the one employee that mayor and council have is our CAO and that the CAO is to be giving directions to all of the directors on things that, that have to be done within the city. And I think that really clarifies it for us uh, because sometimes I think when I came on as a new council member as well, I felt a lot of responsibility that, you know, I have to do this and I have to solve that when actually we have to bring it to our CAO and we debate it as a council. And it's not like we're in business for ourselves, that, that we're one vote, but it's that one vote that, you know, we talk to our fellow colleagues and, and you know, really debate that and make a collective decision for the greatest good. And I, I think, you know, it's really helpful to be reminded of those things. So thank, thank you. Thank you. And I uh, just want to, I'll be glad. And I think on June the 15th, we'll probably be able to have our regular council meeting here in the chambers. I'm just, I don't get all excited with these Zoom meetings. I'll be glad when they're over. Uh, but uh, I think by the 15th, we'll be able to meet and uh, we're in our chambers. Uh, uh, and I think it's uh, when you can sort of have the, the body language and everything else and uh, it's, I'd find it easier. But in the meantime, this is what we had to do in the last three months. We followed the government regulations and the, the provincial Dr. Morrison's uh, suggestions and rules and regulations. So, and it made it difficult too. Uh, Brian was talking about uh, things in the meetings, but it made it difficult to get in touch with people, not ourselves, but if you're calling Charlottetown or you're calling government or you're calling other organizations with everybody uh, maybe not around or they're out for a while or they're working home, but we're, we'll be back on track pretty soon and, uh, and uh, move things along because as was mentioned, we're gonna have a very, very, and it's already started, busy year because I think the building permits come out the other day at over 12 million in the first part of the year so and uh, many big projects about to happen so it's going to be a busy year which is great and uh, we look forward to it i don't see anything else on any of the agendas anybody got any hands to wave to greg campbell is smiling uh, what happened the boston bruins uh, win the stanley cup i was way in before the next fight okay yeah. <laughs> okay we've gotten to the end of the agenda, I believe, uh, 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 Councillor Ramsey. 
You're, you're on mute, uh, Councillor yeah, Ramsey. There I go. Yeah. I just wanted to thank Brian for that presentation. And um, I hope that we can all respect those time limits. I know I'm the same. I get exhausted. It's, you know, most people work all day and then we're in the meetings from five o'clock on. And when 10 o'clock comes, I'm not much good at making a major decision. So, um, you know, I hope that we can do that. And I hope that when we break from uh, council meetings to committee of the whole or committee meetings to uh, committee of the whole that we we do just take that five minutes and you know then move right into our next item because it it becomes long and um, anyway I know people get tired and I, I appreciate um, you doing this Brian and just kind of putting it back in order for us and uh, yeah we'll, and we'll try to abide by those Robert's rules. <laughs> the right decision. You don't want to drag the meeting on. So. I don't right, want to. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> the right decision made at the wrong time. They say is a poor decision. But anyway, we've gotten to the end of the agenda, and uh, let's take a five-minute stretch. Is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> well moved. Moved by Councillor McFeely and seconded by Councillor Deputy Mayor McCollman. All in favor? Thank you very much.